folks, I'm Tom Vassell, and welcome to another episode of Crowd Surfing. This is a show where we talk about Kickstarter and all the stuff that's going on there. And as always, we'll start with the news. Okay, so what projects are currently on Kickstarter? We'll start with Postcard Dungeons. This is an interesting one to me because it is essentially some postcards that you are playing through a dungeon crawl. And I think maybe that's the attraction to people because this one seems to be doing well. It's their first time design. It's just it looks, you know, roll dice, go through dungeon type thing. They're, they're showing two different uh, postcards. They're like a prototype. And then in the video, they show some nicer ones. So it looks nice. I think maybe this is hitting that same vibe that the tiny epic stuff does. Hey, something small that you can keep and play. Polyhedral dice ties. I'm not as impressed with these. You say, why are you mentioning these? Well, I like ties, right? And here's the deal. These ties are $16, which is not too expensive, right? The design of the polyhedral dice is okay. But the fact is, is that you can nowadays go get a custom tie done. I know this. I've got many, many done. And there's so many different images that you can use and design your own. I'm not sure that this project is worth backing. <clears throat> and again, why is it even a Kickstarter? Why not just have a little store where you can sell these? Everdell, this one's doing really well. It gives me kind of a red wall vibe to it, little animals. It's not really war though. This is a worker placement tableau building. The thing that's really most striking about this particular project is Andrew Bosley is the artist here. He is definitely uh, a very good artist. Uh, fantastic, the, the, the whole board here when it's set up looks really amazing. Uh, so I think a lot of people are going to really be drawn to this one. This is the first project from Starling Games, which is essentially just a renamed Game Salute. Uh, Spirits of the Forest, this one is doing extremely well. Part of that is because it is a already known game, Michael Schacht, a lot of people have played the game, and it's by Thunderglyph. Thunderglyph, their Dead Men's Doubloons games did amazing. This game, for being a small little game, uh, really has good components. They're really out doing themselves and making it just look beautiful and gorgeous. Interestingly enough, the deluxe versions and things on it are Kickstarter exclusive, so if you don't get them now, you probably never will. To the other extreme, we have Thunder in the East. This is a war game from Victory Point Games, designed by Frad Chadwick, one of the most renowned war game designers on the Eastern Front. This is the start of a new series called the ETO series. It's a one to two player games. It's a little pricey here at 100 bucks, but you do get a lot of things. And it, it has this throwback. You look at this, you're like, was this game designed in the 70s? Because it doesn't really look... I mean, some parts of it are new, and they're making the dice look beautiful and everything, but it looks like your classic old war game. And that's going to be amazing for you or horrible for you, depending on where you come. Like, some people like me will go, eh. Other people, though, are going to be absolutely flabbergasted, and yay, games like this are still in print, and obviously there's a demand for it. I think Kickstarter is the best place for these bigger, giant war games like this. My Kickstarter pick of the week this time is Western Legends. This one is really uh, steamrolling across Kickstarter from a new company, Colossal Games, which I think, no pun intended, will become a giant in the industry as time goes by. Uh, they have good business plan. They have a lot of great games lined up. This is a pretty big splash. This one from a unknown designer, basically, but it is a sandbox Western game. You're going to be heroes, you're going to be villains, you can go around and do whatever you want. I haven't played the game, but I've uh, talked to the designers and had a little bit of an explanation through it. It just looks fascinating. The sandbox idea is interesting to me, a game where you can just do whatever you want. The Western theme, the Wild Wild West theme, is also very fun and entertaining, so I hope this one is as good as it looks. Hero Path Dragon Roar. This is the second time this Kickstarter has shown up. Although this time it's funding. It's a 3D adventure game with models. The biggest problem here with this game is that the graphic design looks dated to me. The game is pretty in spots, but like the miniatures are okay. The graphic design looks like it's from the 90s. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping the game is good. There's not too many adventure games. There's a lot of dungeon crawls, but this one looks more like it's an adventure across the lands and things. So I hope that it is better than it looks. Highlander the board game. Speaking of games that don't look that fantastic, this one is funding, I am almost positive, sheerly on the force of its uh, license. This is from River Horse Games, and in this one you pick one of the uh, titular uh, Highlander characters, and you're going to go through and have duels and show up and fight other people, and one, you know, there, are, there can only be one or whatever. 
Uses a lot of screenshots. Um, it's, it doesn't look that great, honestly. The look, right? I mean, Highlander, and I'm sure there's a lot of Highlander fans out there. I think it's okay. But, I mean, there's a lot of Highlander fans out there, and that's going to be exciting to them. But I hope it's a good game, and I'm not, like, the Kickstarter itself hasn't won me over. This one's interesting. Tokyo series of games here. This is a series of games that you can get through this one. This is from the same folks who made Import Export, which seems to be really well. A lot of people are liking it as a Glory to Rome uh, replacement. This one has three games inside it. Well, three games. -ish. It's hard to explain. Tokyo Jiro Hanbaki. This is a game about Japanese vending machines, which I love because that's a great new theme. I love when there's a theme. I'm like, ooh, I like that theme. This is one of those. But this one is actually not one game. It's 20 mini games designed by a whole variety of people. Well, the guy who designed uh, Rory Story Cubes did one of the, the game designs. So all sorts of little mini games, I think, inside this one. So I like the pieces. They look great. And then there's Tokyo Metro. This is the other extreme. These are not light little games. This is a big, heavy economic simulation on the Japanese Metro system. Now, I don't know how big it is. It's two hours, so it can't be too overblown, but a heavier game. And then Tokyo Jutaku, which is a larger version of normal Jutaku, which is a real-time dexterity game. So these are three different games. And, uh, you know, if you brought us me a paper, I would say separate them. Don't kickstart them together. But the Kickstarter is doing really well. And all three, I mean, for me, I'm like, eh, I'm interested in all three of them. I like to see them. So this will be interesting to see this one when it comes out. Fourth quarter football is about American football from a UK company, which is a little, you know, it's, a little, it's odd to me. It's kind of like America, an American company making a rugby game. Um, it looks like a miniatures game with football players. Now, because it's, you know, licensing is expensive. There's going to be no NFL, no college which I think might hurt it in the long run, but it is funding. So if you want to play a miniature style game with football players, you got it. And then finally, AN Dice. These are the world's first series of ancient numerical dice, which are showing dice with the old symbols on them, Babylonian symbols, Sumerian symbols. And the, the dice themselves are made of zinc alloy, which I don't think is as old as it. I mean, they're going to be like little metal dice, but the symbology on them this is something that, I mean, I always like to talk about dice on the show here, and this is one I go, oh, that's interesting. I would not mind getting some of those for my dice collection. All right, that's the news. Hey, folks, Robert here, and normally this is where I'd say what's funding, and we would go into a game. And we are going to look at a game today, but I'm actually going to be renaming this segment to FOMO, which normally means fear of missing out. And that's something we've all experienced one time or another, normally in regards to Kickstarter projects, especially I know I have. Whether I back it or not, am I gonna miss out on those exclusives? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at a game that I haven't decided if I'm going to back or not, and maybe you have taken a look at it as well, and we'll just give you a look at it and then give you my overall thoughts. Today, we're gonna be taking a look at Supernatural Socks. Supernatural Socks is a game where players are trying to wash their dirty socks while trying to prevent their opponents from getting their socks into their laundry basket with a little otherworldly assistance. Players will be attempting to wash socks such as mismatched, kids, ankle, dress, and toe socks while trying to avoid getting a pair of tidy whities mixed in or ending up with a dirty sock added to their already washed dryer pile. Each player starts with a hand of seven cards, comprising of six sock cards and one ghost card, and all players at the table will simultaneously select face down three sock cards to play, and then everyone reveals them at once. In player order, socks are then played to their washers or possibly to other players' washers, applying any effects such as ankle socks, which when played on their own allow you to take the top sock from the lost sock pile, or business socks, which actually go directly to the player's dryer. Players then have the option of drawing one or two ghost cards to their hand, keeping in mind their hand limit of seven total cards. You can get one ghost card if you played a matching set as part of your three cards, or two if you played three different cards. In player order, then ghosts may be played, applying their effects such as Wacky Wilbur, who allows you to snatch a sock from another player's washer, or Terrible Tony, who allows you to break a player's dryer for one round, even your own. After this, all socks in each player's dryer is scored if their dryer isn't currently broken, and all socks in the washer are moved to the dryer with the exception of toe socks if this is their first time through, as they do require two wash cycles. Scoring socks is based on sets. For example, a single ankle sock is only worth two points, but a pair of them is worth 10. 
Players then draw back up to their hand limit and play continues with the first player card passing to the next player in clockwise order. Players play until a player crosses a threshold of points that was determined by the players at the start of the game and then one final round is played. Any socks left over in the player's area after that is scored at a reduced value and whoever has the most points is the winner. So that's a brief look at Supernatural Socks. Now this game does have a really high degree of take that, but I really liked about this game, however, was just the original theme within it. I can't say that I've ever played a game that is about washing my dirty socks and having a supernatural force affect that. But with that said, the game does have a lot of Take That, so if you're not into Take That, this is probably not the game for you. But if you do enjoy Take That, this is a really fun original game. I also did like the set collection, and I like the way that set collection per round, so you can't really keep building up those sets unless you take advantage of ways to maybe break your own dryer or put dirty socks into your own dryer to move things back. Looking at my new system, which I'm calling FOMO, fear of missing out, but instead is going to stand for fun factor, originality and theme, mechanisms, and overall, these are my scores on it. I do know that they are still tweaking the rules a little bit, and I expect they should have all that done pretty soon. If the game interests you, take a look at their Kickstarter, and I look forward to seeing you folks next time. Hey folks, Mark here, and welcome back to another Dice Tower Preview Recap. Randy and I recently took a look at some new projects on Kickstarter. First up, we have Hero Path. Hero Path is a game of high adventure. You and other heroes will join together to eradicate evil forces from the land. You will start the game together, but each hero will be on their own path, experiencing unique places, facing vicious monsters, and struggling to gain power. Be the hero that obtains the most power and you will be the one to slay the dragon. The game features these prism place sites, indicating locations where you can gather goods and training to become the ultimate dragon hunter. Hero Path is for two to four players and brought to you by BGD Board Game Distribution. Next up we have Candy Bomber. It's 1948 and World War II has left Germany divided between ally and Soviet powers. Because Allied-controlled West Berlin is locked behind Soviet borders and cut off from all land transportation, the people of the city must rely entirely on air support for all their supplies. Play as a pilot, each with their own unique power. You must work cooperatively with the other players to strategize how best to use your character's strengths to fly missions in and out of West Berlin and help the people avoid starvation under the threat of Soviet control. This one features some really neat historical tidbits throughout the game. Candy Bomber is for one to four players and is brought to you by Cedar Fort Publishing and Media. And lastly, we have Warpgate. This one just recently hit Kickstarter. Warpgate is a fast paced game of hand management and area control. Move your fleets of starships on a hex based modular game board. Establish colonies and outposts. Engage your enemy in battles for the control of prized commodities. Research new technologies and grow your galactic empire. Explore and control the galaxy. Warpgate is for two to four players and is brought to you by Wolf Designa. For more details on each of these games mentioned here, please check out our full previews and see if these games might be a good fit for you. And if you are interested in having your games featured as a Dice Tower preview, please reach out to Tom or myself. And keep an eye out for more previews in the near future. All right, folks, until next time, we'll see you at the table. So I'm running my own Kickstarter right now for the Dice Tower, and it's, you know, you're welcome to go back that if you like what we do, and we appreciate that. And one of the questions I get asked frequently is, why are you using Kickstarter over Indiegogo? Uh, last year, we decided to use Indiegogo for a variety of reasons, and I thought I would talk about that a little bit. We wanted to use Indiegogo because it's independent. Uh, you know, they're, they're, well, not independent, but they're different than Kickstarter, right? And so, hey, Kickstarter, Kickstarter's not always the most responsive team, although they are much more than they used to be in the past. Um, I'll talk about that another time, but they've certainly got better. Uh, Indiegogo also offered the opportunity to use PayPal, which was a cool thing. Hey, you don't think you just use credit cards, you can use PayPal. Halfway through our campaign last year, they canceled that. Without any kind of like warning to me, I was a little disgruntled about that to some degree. And that was one of the reasons we went there. 
Indiegogo has slightly lesser fees than Kickstarter. Not huge, and you know, they negotiate with me a lower fee. Uh, there could be some argument made, though, that Indiegogo's fees do not uh, make up for the fact that they're not as widely present as Kickstarter. But they definitely have lower fees, and Indiegogo has a few things, like you can do multiple pledges on Indiegogo you can't do on Kickstarter. Now, I've switched back to Kickstarter for several reasons, and we'll talk about that next time. Uh, the, the going back to Kickstarter, there's a lot of different factors in play, but I want to talk one thing I did like better on Indiegogo than I like on Kickstarter, and maybe people disagree with me on this, and that's canceling pledges. On Indiegogo, when you go in and you pledge for something, you pledge for it, you pay for it, the transaction's finished. Now, you can go through and ask for your money back, but the transaction is done. And this is especially in the case of you of these partial funding campaigns. And it tells you that. It's not a surprise to anyone who comes through. Um, and in Kickstarter, you can cancel your pledge. Now, the problem with the Kickstarter canceling pledges, there's a lot of people who play a game with the Kickstarter pledges, and it's not fair to other backers and to the person who makes the project themselves. So let's say, for example, there's a pledge of $500, and I'm like, oh, I'll do that. I uh, To the point where Kickstarter people go in and make the pledges for the large amounts right away without even looking at them. What's the biggest pledge you can do? Boom, you can do it. Why can you do it? Because uh, if if the, you know, I change my mind later on, I can change it to a dollar or cancel my pledge, and there's no negativity back from you, there's nothing. So I can make a $500 pledge for something, and then later on I can cancel that pledge, no problems, no questions asked, and that causes two problems. One, the creator was kind of counting on that money, so they're watching the amount go up and it goes down. Two, someone else might have wanted that pledge, they go in, oh, those pledges are gone. So rather than sit there and constantly be checking the Kickstarter to see if people back their, you know, cancel their pledge, they're like, oh, I'll go somewhere else. Then later on, when you cancel your $500 pledge, those people who would have pledged it are not there. And I always say, and, and when I run a Kickstarter, I send out a thing that says, please, if you're going to cancel your pledge, cancel it now. You know, that way other people who might want these pledges can come in and get them. And it almost feels... Uh, like people are being a jerk when they do this. Now, don't get, I'm not, there are sometimes I know people back a Kickstarter and as the Kickstarter goes by, they're like, whoa, I don't have the money for this. Something else came up. I need to pay for a new heater or whatever. And they pull out of that Kickstarter because they need to use the money somewhere else. I understand that. But most of the time, it's just someone going, nah, I don't want to back that anymore. Or, I was never really planning to back in the first place. Or, I was going to see how many stretch goals we met. Or, it's doing well, it doesn't need my pledge. Whatever. The fact is, when you pull out, and some people pull out in the last hour, right? In the final minutes, they'll pull out of the Kickstarter. And I have data to back this up because I've seen it on my Kickstarters. It happens on my Kickstarters. It's definitely happening on other people's Kickstarters. Where the very last bit, they're pulling out. And it just hurts everyone involved. It's not, you know, it's kind of like me running to the grocery store, grabbing the only thing there that's available and you're like oh I was gonna buy that sorry I got there first and they're kind of sad and then later on right before I go to the cash register I put it back on the shelf I don't want it anymore that person's already left the store and they can't get it and then the store closes so the store's like we well, could have sold that the other person's like I would have bought it and you're like well sorry and how do we fix this problem well this is where I don't know I mean I think part of its communication we saying that you might be doing this thinking yeah it's no big deal but it really is a big deal, both to the Kickstarter creator and to other backers who would back it. But maybe you don't think it's a big deal. Let me know in the comments. Uh, and I understand, you know, this is one of the reasons a lot of people didn't like Indiegogo when we went to it. They're like, I don't want to pay now. But why wouldn't you care if you pay now? Why, why is paying now is good for the creator? Paying now is good for the campaign. And you're like, but I'm not sure if I want it. Then don't pledge until you're sure. And then you say, but yeah, but if I don't pledge now, I might not get the thing I, I want. Well, that's how that works. That's how life works in general. I want to buy something. Should I buy it now? And so Kickstarter has kind of this weird policy. There's this 30-day window, or however long the Kickstarter campaign is. So how do you guys think this should be fixed? What are your solutions to this? Or maybe you don't even see it as a problem. I think it is a problem. It's not like a campaign ruining problem, although it's a big deal. I've talked to many Kickstarter backers. It's a big deal. It's discouraging for the backers because, or for the Kickstarter creators because you'll look at your project and some days you'll have a negative thing because all of a sudden a bunch of people canceled pledges. Again, not because they suddenly hate the game or because you made a weird update, but because just it's getting close to the end and people are like, oh, I'm pulling out. 
On the flip side, if you're looking to back Kickstarter and all the good stuff's gone, you might go there for a couple days before it ends because and just keep refreshing because someone's bound to drop their pledge. I just don't know that I like that idea. Maybe there should be something where you can say, hey, when this pledge is, send me a quick email. Send me some sort of notification. Let me know what you guys think about this. Let's keep moving. Hi, this is Jamie Stegmeier from Stonemeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about how to ask for feedback effectively about your project page. One of the things I do before I launch a Kickstarter campaign, usually a few weeks in advance, is by that point I put together the project page and I send out a preview link to a number of people. I uh, this is key. Two things are key here. One, I'm doing it well in advance of the project, so I actually have time to implement the feedback. And two, I'm not just sending it to one or two people, not just a few close friends. I'm sending it to a variety of people. Um, and I've seen many people do this on Facebook. They'll post to one, maybe the Kickstarter best practices group. They'll post up their preview link a week or two before the project. And that's great because then you're getting feedback from completely random strangers who have no investment in you at all. And you'll actually get blunt, honest feedback. Um, some of the ways that you can make sure that you're, you're on the right path for this feedback are A, uh, be open to actually receiving feedback. So when you choose the questions you ask, and I recommend asking a few specific questions, you can ask a global question like, what do you think about the project page? But I always try to think of a few things that I'm actually really concerned about, like, is the price fair? Or is this image effective? Is, is the video long enough or too short? It, you know, very specific things about the project page. When I ask those questions, I ask myself, am I really looking for feedback about this? Am I really willing to change it? Or am I just looking for affirmation? And if you're just looking for people to affirm you and, and, and approve you, that's great. That feels good. You can do that with a few friends. But if you're asking the public for feedback, or if, you're, if you want to respect people's time if you're asking for feedback, actually be willing, make sure you ask things that you're actually willing to act on, that you're actually willing to, to hear. Um, and one way to pay attention to actually, if you're not willing to hear that, is if your first reaction is defensive. If so, if the first time someone gives you feedback about something, if you defend the choice that you've made, then you probably know that you're not actually willing to change that thing and, and you shouldn't be asking for feedback about it. Um, that actually sums it up. Uh, I, I've looked over my, I have a blog entry here about how to give and take tough love feedback. There's some more details on that blog entry, but overall, I've talked about the key things today. Do it in advance, ask a number of people, including some strangers, and ask specific questions about things that you were actually willing to act on and receive feedback on. Good luck, thanks. Hey, hello there, Crowd Foundation. My new pledge is for a game called Record from Yanaguena Games, uh, and it's a game for two to four players. And on this game, you're a guitarist trying to gain fame. Record is an action selection game where you choose one of the three actions. You can take a pick from the public pile, which is filled according to the number of players, and then uh, place on the threat board and take its action. You can take a pick from the bag, and you can view it privately and place it face down on the threat board. Every pick has a color in each face, so when you place it face down, other players won't know which color did you play. Or you can draw two cards, which are actual guitar chords, and this is the second way you can score points uh, on this game. So you score points for the thread board every time you put the less uh, pick on one of the thread, and at that point you just score the whole thread board. If one of the chords on your hand is played, you can play your card and gain those points. And if you're able to play the same chord later on in the game, you get the record score. I thought record was a really fun game, it has a really intriguing theme that I haven't seen before. I love to build the chords on the thread board. Um, the pledge started at $29 and goes through the first week of February. Uh, Inaguana Games, record. That's my pledge this week. Hey, Board Gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with more Kickstarter Lanyap. That's right, I'm bringing you projects that won't break your budget, but throw in a little something extra. Here's what caught my eye this week. I've been checking out a new project from Calliope Games, the makers of such great games as Suro and Sur of the Sea. I love playing games with different themes, and it seems like there aren't enough gangster or heist-type games out there, but Ken Franklin has designed a pretty good-looking attempt 
at a heist game. In the Mansky Caper, players play different characters out to rob the treasures contained in Big Al Mansky's safes. Big Al's a mob boss with a mansion full of goodies, and it looks like he hasn't been treating his family right lately, so they're ready to even the score while Big Al is on vacation. I love the play count from two to six players, and the game time is listed at 40 to 60 minutes, so that's right in my wheelhouse. Now, one of my favorite mechanics is the good old press your luck mechanic, and that's central to this game. Players will take turns exploring the big house, cracking open those safes, using their special powers to split the loot and get out safely. But get too greedy, and don't stash your goods in the getaway car, and everything could go boom. Let's take a look at the pledge levels. They're really just one pledge level to look at. For 32 bucks, you're going to get the entire game. And as a little bit of lanyap, there's free shipping for anyone in the United States. Checking out the game, you have the full retail version is going to include the game board rooms, the money and jewels, player standees, stash bags and cards. Hey, and another bit of lanyap for me, some cool 3D cardboard safes. You can even check out a how-to video by the designer himself on the page or download the rule book to read the rules yourself. There aren't any stretch goals, but you can get premium add-ons like these wooden safes that come from the broken token. They're only 15 bucks. So to recap, for $32 you get the entire game with all the components and the cardboard 3D safes. And for those of you in America, a little bit of lanyap with free shipping thrown in. So that's the, that's the Mansky Caper out on Kickstarter right now. What do you think of the game? Let us know in the comments below. And until next time, les le bon temps roulé. All right. Well, that is another crowd surfing show. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks to Jamie and Robert and everyone who helps put these together. I appreciate all the work that goes into these. And I hope that these Kickstarters, you know, I'm not here hoping that these guys fail. I like to see many of these projects succeed. We are out of the end of last year where there's kind of a dearth of Kickstarters. There's still not a ton of them, but there's a good chunk of them that are coming out now. And this is only going to exponentially increase as each month comes. If you're in the kickstarting mood, I would of course encourage you to check out our own Kickstarter, the Dice Tower uh, 2018. If you think videos like this are worth your time, then we ask that you pledge a little bit to help us keep doing these. Until next time though, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Crowd Surfing on the Dice Tower.